Welcome to Melt University's 2020 Summer Program. This year, our virtual intern program will help you build your brand, inform you on a variety of career paths, and introduce you to top executives in sports and marketing. Here's your host, President and CEO of Melt, one of the largest independent sports and event marketing agencies in the country, Vince Thompson. Welcome back, students. Summer Virtual Melt University 2020. We have had a tremendous amount of great participants, some of the best in the business, sports, events, sports marketing. And speaking of some of the best, one of my dear friends and truly a pioneer in this space, revived the Peach Bowl, built it as a model, made it a CFP destination, made it a national championship destination, uh, pioneered the kickoff classic model, was instrumental in bringing the College Football Hall of Fame to Atlanta. And I could go on and on and on and on. Um, Gary Stoken is the CEO and president of Peach Bowl, Inc., a title he's held since 1998. During his tenure, he's generated an economic impact of more than a billion dollars to the city of Atlanta, state of Georgia, positioned the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl as one of the premier bowl game organizations in the country. Um, it is one of the New Year's Six bowl games in the CFP, Rose Sugar, Orange Fiesta, Cotton. But he learned his passion early. He was a successful student athlete, a basketball player, assistant coach, graduate of North Carolina State, an amazing, amazing career with Adidas, with Converse, started and owned uh, two sports marketing companies, has been the president of Atlanta Tip-Off Club, CEO of Atlanta Hall Management, president of Atlanta Sports Council, uh, one of the most influential uh, Atlantans. He has been a tremendous friend to me, tremendous supporter. We've built a tremendous relationship. He's a mentor to me. Uh, he will talk to you about the value uh, building uh, tremendous relationships. He'll talk to you about the future of college sports marketing, but uh, I want to give a special uh, melt you welcome to my dear friend, Gary Stoken. Gary, thank you for joining us today. Well, Vince, first off, let me tell all, all your students listening that you're going to probably send me a bill after that introduction, <laughs> right. which any good sports marketing person would do. But no, I, I just want to congratulate and thank you for what you're doing to help our industry grow because uh, what you do with this Melt U is sensational. I think it's the only one in the country and you're kind and you have a good heart, but you're also willing to uh, look forward and help people in the next generation grow into this industry. And that's what we need to do. So I'm happy to be here. I appreciate you having me and certainly want to congratulate you on all your success and thank you. Look forward to uh, to our session today. Well, thank you so much, and 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 uh, and like I said, we're honored to have you. And so, Gary, one thing that we're trying to several several objectives of our program, several things that we're trying to get the best in the business to impart um, is um, your passion, and whatever you do, pursue it with the with passionate zeal. So clearly early on in your life, early on in your career, early on in your path as a student athlete at North Carolina State, you had a, you had a true passion for sports. And so talk about uh, to our kids and to our listeners about really your passion, how you translate that passion into a career and how they could and should do the same. Yeah, I appreciate that question because it is the basis of everything you want to do in life in the, in the workforce or really anything in life is I always tell people, follow your passion, whether that's to be an attorney, whether that's to be, you know, a sports marketing, uh, executive, whether that's to be a, a garbage man, it, it doesn't matter. Whatever you are passionate about, chase that passion. Don't follow it, chase it. And don't worry about how much money you're going to make. Don't worry about, you know, what your uh, titles are going to be. Just follow your passion, because if you follow your passion, you're going to get really good at what you do. You, you become really good at what you do. People are going to want to hire you 
and you always have a job. And more importantly than anything, you're never going to work a day in your life. Mm-hmm. I don't know when my checks come, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm not encumbered by all the uh, the problems that people have that aren't working in their passion. Mm-hmm. Worry about what time of day it is, how many days a week, what day of the week it is. You know, I enjoy myself so much in what I do that it allows me a basis of being able to help other people because uh, as Proverbs eleven twenty five, he who refreshes others will he himself be refreshed, just like you're doing here, Vince. Um, and so follow your passion, get really good at what you do. Someone will always want to hire you or you'll enjoy what you do the rest of your life and you'll be happy. And there's a lot to be said, especially in this day and time that we live in, to be happy in your own life. So as a, so obviously to play uh, as a student athlete, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit, but, but as a student athlete, you, you had to be a pretty good basketball player in high school. You obviously a pretty good basketball player in college, knowing or thinking that you were, or may, may or not have gone go, go pro NBA or CBL or whatever it was. How did you make that pivot? Uh, into the business world because I, I remember you telling me some great stories of the old days. You worked with Adidas and Converse. You know the plight of student athletes. So how did you make that pivot from the college campus? Because we say the college campus is the greatest professional laboratory that a college kid will ever be around. But how how did you make that transition? And talk about talk about your early days of building the career. Yeah, I, I obviously wanted to play professional basketball, but wasn't good enough. You know, everybody reached a point in the pyramid of their career of, uh, you know, hitting the top of the pyramid. And I hit mine when I was in college. Mm -hmm. So I studied business management at North Carolina State. And, uh, you know, I knew I wanted to stay in sports. My father had been the, uh, the head ticket sales manager at the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh, which is similar to State Farm Arena in Atlanta as an NL. Mm-hmm. And um, I had spent time around him. And so I was always around sports and played sports growing up. So I had an opportunity when I was going to graduate where my head coach, Norm Sloan, said, Gary, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to go back to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I was from. I'm going to teach high school and coach high school basketball. And he said, well, I want you to stay with me and coach college basketball at North Carolina State. So he gave me my first opportunity, and uh, I coached for three years. Um, I moved out of coaching when Coach Sloan went to Florida and Jimmy Valvano came into NC State. Both of them wanted me to go with them. Wow. State with Jimmy Valvano or go to Florida with Norm Sloan, but I had decided to move into the business side of sports and uh, I had an opportunity to go to work for Adidas mm-hmm. um, and was very fortunate and blessed to have that opportunity because I was able to sign Mike Krzyzewski when he came from Army to he- take the head coaching job at Duke. Wow. Uh, I was able to sign Herschel Walker when he went from college to the USFL. And I was able to, and just reliving it, able to work with a player by the name of Michael Jordan. Wow. Who, uh, although couldn't wear Adidas in college because Dean Smith, his coach, had a Converse contract, I uh, had the opportunity to potentially sign him to go pro in 1984. And um, unfortunately, watching the 30 for 30s and <laughs> right. reliving uh, what happened uh, is crushing. But um, it, it taught me something as I look back on my career that may be relevant for this. And that is if you really believe in something, no matter, matter your status or your level of employment, to, again, passionately push for that. I had Michael Jordan ready to sign with Adidas. And unfortunately, I sent a three-page marketing campaign, integrated marketing campaign to Europe to Herzegonara, West Germany. The wall was still up, mm-hmm. and that's where Adidas was headquartered. And uh, the uh, people in Adidas, Germany, got back to me and said, we don't have that kind of money to put in the U.S. market. 
So wow. as I was, you know, really at the, the lowest level stage at Adidas, and it was about 28 years old, and uh, I, I didn't push the issue. And I knew that Michael Jordan would be very successful. Obviously, I, no one knew he'd be this successful. Uh, right. But as Michael told me, sitting in Chapel Hill on, on Franklin Street on the stone wall at Chapel Hill, Gary, I love you, or he called me Mr. Stoken at the time. I love you. I love your product. If you'll just get close to the Nike deal, I'll sign with you. Uh, you've been great to me and my family. And uh, I had to tell him that, you know, Adidas didn't have the money to put in. And so he signed with Nike and kind of the rest is history. It's a $3 billion Air Jordan product line now. And um, it really, at the time in 1984, Nike was going out of business. Mm -hmm. Shoe Dogs, which is Phil Knight's book. Mm -hmm. And um, if we would have signed Michael Jordan, we may have put Nike out of business. Mm -hmm. But the lesson is push. If you really believe in something, push it and don't let people discourage you. Don't let people tell you no. And if you're right, just keep pushing. Well, I, you, you know, and, and students, I want you guys to go back and replay that. We really literally, and I had never heard, I've heard, had heard bits and pieces of this story from Gary, but you're listening to the guy that had Michael Jordan sign two in Adidas contracts. I want you to think about the history and the path that Michael would have taken possibly that Gary would have taken possibly and talking about getting thrown. Gary, we talk a lot about, it's not a question of if, but when a kid's going to get thrown off the saddle, it's how you get back on that saddle. It's how you, you know, the, the letters in O don't spell no. It's the first two letters of the words, not yet. Uh, but how do you, how do you professionally recover from, from getting thrown off the saddle of not being able to sign Michael Jordan, like what, what happened next? Well, and it's interesting. I, two things about that that are relevant for your listeners. One is I had signed the greatest basketball college basketball coach in Mike Krzyzewski. I had signed the greatest, uh, Vince might argue this being an Auburn guy with Bo Jackson, but <laughs> arguably the greatest, uh, college football player in history in Herschel Walker. And I had Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player ever, ready to sign and didn't get the money to do it. It was only two and a half million dollars, which back then was a lot of money. But Michael Jordan sold one hundred twenty six million dollars of Air Jordan product his first year, which put Nike back in the black. And as I said, the rest is history. Um, but I want to tell them two stories. One is. When I was in high school, I had committed to play basketball and go to college at Cincinnati. And in August of that year, which was only about four weeks before school was ready to start, uh, my assistant coach at Cincinnati, who signed me, called me and said, we don't have your scholarship anymore. We just signed uh, Jimmy Webb. Six foot five high school All American from South Bend, Indiana. And so we're sorry, but we don't have your scholarship. And at, you know, 17 years old, I was devastated. Wow. I went to a small school in Pennsylvania, played my freshman year, and wrote to probably 50 universities that year to see if I could transfer. Now, at the time, transferring was not a widely, as widely accepted as it is now. If you transferred, people looked at you as a problem child or, you know, am I going to take this transfer? Why is he wanting to transfer? Is he going to cause a problem? So I went to work at North Carolina State's basketball camp that summer through a friend of mine who was the assistant basketball coach at North Carolina State as a counselor. Now, mind you, in 1974, NC State had just won the national championship in basketball with David Thompson and Monty Tao and Tommy Burleson. That's one of my favorite teams, by the way. Was it? So I, yeah. so I go down there and I worked the camp and I'm playing at night. We play counselor games with David and Monty and Tommy Burleson. And I'm playing with these guys. And I said, I can play with these guys. Wow. So I said, I'm going to transfer here. So I transferred to North Carolina State. 
Eddie Beanbaugh, who was the assistant coach there, said, Gary, you may not play a second. You're not on scholarship. You got to pay your own way. But I uh, worked that summer in uh, uh, Boilermakers uh, and made some money. My, my family took, took a loan out and I went to school and paid my first year. So you think about following your passion, how many people would transfer to the team that just won the national championship? <laughs> right. They could get a scholarship and play basketball there. But that's where my passion kicked in. And, uh, you know, when you talk about facing adversity at a young age, you know, that was a tremendous blow to me. And, uh, one, you know, getting a scholarship uh, that to North Carolina State that year because I busted my butt. Mm -hmm. um, graduated with a degree in business management and was offered a job uh, by my head coach to work there. So, um, again, that's that's a story of facing adversity and, and rising above it. The second one was at Adidas, you asked. Um, what I did is I went to work even harder uh, because I, I just, you know, again, passionately, uh, I knew that I was right. I knew that I had done all the things I could do to, uh, to help my company. And so at that point, I took on a, a philosophy, and I think this is relevant for anybody in any business. I started to think, okay, I need to work for Adidas because they're paying me, but I need to build my business based on relationships. So I need to work for whoever I'm trying to contact do a contract with or build a relationship with. Mm -hmm. My job was basically to sign pro athletes, college coaches to and teams to an Adidas contract and build and create an integrated marketing campaign using that asset of that player or coach or team to positively impact sales. And so I, I started, which I've carried to this day, um, that when I work for somebody, I know I'm getting paid by them, but I also work for the other person who I'm trying to do a contract with or create a business relationship with. Mm -hmm. What that does is it makes me walk a mile in their moccasin, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So whenever I do a deal and part of my business philosophy is pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. Whenever you do a business deal, you don't want to be the hog. You don't want to hog the whole deal. You want to create a relationship where that party on the other side feels like you've treated them fairly. And because you've treated them fairly, you've built a friendship, a relationship that they're going to come back to you and do business with you, repeat business for the rest of your career. Mm -hmm. That's important because if you hog a deal, you may do one deal, but you'll never do a deal with that person again. Mm -hmm. And I've done repeat business and part of my internal business philosophy is team, teamwork, empowerment, accountability, management. We can talk about that separately, but the external business relationship I teach to my team and my company as CEO and president is care. Always C is for customer. Always treat the customer first. A is for, for attitude. Always bring a great attitude to anything you do. Because if you have a great attitude, you got a chance to make something great happen. Mm -hmm. If you have a piss poor attitude, I guarantee you something bad's going to happen because you're right. R and care is for relationships. Always build deep, long lasting relationships because you never know, like these college students right now, keep these relationships you have at school because. 10, 15, 20 years from now, one of your one of your colleagues at school, uh, classmates, may be a CEO of a company that you want to do Amen. with. Amen. So that's R. And then E is for excellence. We always strive for excellence in all that we do. Don't always get there. Don't always hit it. But if you strive for excellence, you got a better chance of getting there than not. So uh, that's care. That's our external business philosophy. And that's uh, that's how I personally work as well. Well, I, it's students, as you're listening, go back and listen to this. Write this down. C-A-R-E. 
is an amazing acronym. And whether the customer is your employer or a personal relationship, the golden rule, customer attitude, relationships, pursue uh, with passionate excellence. So Gary, um, college football, huge business. Uh, you had built a successful business career. I remember as a kid, the Peach Bowl to me was like a really big deal. Uh, and then it sort of <clears throat> faded, bowls faded. The big ones were still there, the cotton, the sugar, whatever. What what, what was your path that led you, because there's several stories within this. First of all, your path to the Peach Bowl. And then the fact that you were you convinced a young and growing organization, the Chick-fil-A organization, uh, to hitch uh, their ride to the Peach Bowl. And I would dare say the rest is history for both organizations because I think what the work you did with Chick-fil-A and the Peach Bowl has revolutionized college sports marketing and it certainly contributed to massive growth of the Chick-fil-A chain. So talk about that path and that journey, how you got there and then we'll evolve into the various opportunities and careers within the bowl organization. Okay. And, and certainly uh, you do nothing on your own. Everything has to have some form of teamwork uh, involved in it. And so I've been very blessed to have uh, not only the blessings of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, being a Christian mm -hmm. and Catholic, but great people to work with. Um, and so after I left Adidas, I went to Converse, was, was national basketball manager for Converse. And I could tell you some stories there and then went uh, and started my own sports marketing company. We, uh, we sold it to a company from London in 1996 before the Olympic Games. And at the time, had another opportunity to go back to Adidas as the global business unit manager on a worldwide basis. And we had just signed Kobe Bryant. And so I put a global marketing campaign for Kobe Bryant when uh, we launched his first shoe. Um, but I had spent probably as the global business unit manager, probably about 150,000 miles traveling from Atlanta to Portland, where my office was. And then I also had to travel globally across wow. Europe because I had a uh, basketball business unit manager in Italy, Spain, Germany, France, uh, Japan, uh, you know, all over the United States, all around the world working for me to promote the basketball line and sell the basketball line in the respective states or countries. So at the time, uh, my predecessor, Robert Dale Morgan, uh, left the Peach Bowl and the Atlanta Sports Council to go run the Super Bowl in 1998 that we were gonna host in Atlanta in 2000. Mm -hmm. And I had helped Robert Dale get his job in Atlanta and uh, he was an old friend. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had subsequently served as a volunteer when I was, you know, with Converse, with Adidas and owned my sports marketing companies because all those jobs were in Atlanta. I served as a volunteer on the Atlanta Sports Council on the Peach Bowl committees. Mm -hmm. So the uh, board of the uh, Sports Council and the chamber and the, and the, the, the uh, bowl game uh, said, how would you like to come work back in Atlanta full-time and run the sports council and the peach bowl? And my daughters were just going into middle school and I thought it was a good time for me to come back off the road and, uh, work in Atlanta. So I, uh, headhunter offered me the job and, uh, two weeks later in September 98, I became the president of Atlanta Sports Council, the president of the bowl game, and, uh, you know, had the opportunity to really, after the Olympic Games in 96, borrow, and that's the other thing you should learn is sometimes the best ideas aren't necessarily out of your own brain, but if you cobble them together with some of your own creative thoughts, you may hit on something. Mm-hmm. Bob Costas had uh, said, you know, with the Super Bowl coming and the Olympics, that Atlanta is going to be the sports capital of the world. 
And so in 1998, after we had the Olympics in 96, I used that phrase and used that as my overriding philosophy and business model to say, okay, we are going to make that come true. So we went after Super Bowls, Final Fours, SEC championship, ACC tournaments, basketball tournaments, the NHL All-Star Game, the uh, NBA All-Star Game, Major League Baseball All-Star Game, uh, WrestleMania, to recruit all of these events to Atlanta because we had, again, you have to take a look at the assets that you have and build them in an integrated marketing campaign. I use a philosophy called AIM, Asset Integrated Management or Asset Integrated Marketing, where you uh, create goals, look at the actuals you have, the, the assets that you have, and build strategies around those. So I knew that we had a great airport, the number one airport in the world, most effective and efficient. Number two, we had 13,000 hotel rooms downtown, great hotel rooms that were in walking distance to our facilities, mm -hmm. first class facilities. We also had some of the top um, companies in sports, uh, whether it's Chick-fil-A or Coca-Cola or Delta or UPS, uh, Home Depot, uh, headquartered in Atlanta. So I took all of that, built a recipe to make Atlanta the sports capital of the world, and we went out and with a lot of great work by the board, a lot of great work by the staff, and a lot of great work by the volunteers in the city of Atlanta, along with the facility partnerships we had, you know, we created something special. So you had a vision, you had a shared vision, you had a collective vision, uh, you had momentum, you had a halo, the 96 Olympics clearly uh, I believe was a, a, a giant turning point for the city. Then you obviously had the Super Bowl in 2000. And so um, tell me how this, the marriage with the Kathy family and Chick-fil-A, how did it come together? Because like I said, I still think it's one of the, been one of the greatest sports marketing stories of all time. It's a great, a huge success story. Um, and, you know, so how did, tell us the genesis of that. Well, first off, we were blessed to uh, have the opportunity to work with uh, Truett Cathy and Dan Cathy and Bubba and, and Trudy Cathy, number one. Mm -hmm. They're just really quality people that when they develop a partnership, it's going to be give and take. And again, back to that, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. They're going to mm -hmm. together. They're going to work just as hard for you as you're going to work as hard for them. And so that was the baseline. That was the undergrowing foundation that we were blessed to have. And then you had people like Steve Robinson and David Salyers and Jeff Henderson and Robert McLaughlin, people within Chick-fil-A that really loved the game of college football. And at the time, they didn't have a lot of marketing dollars. All of their marketing dollars was spent against the title sponsorship of the bowl game. Wow. Wow. And at that time, their uh, stores overlaid the ACC and the SEC region perfectly, mm -hmm. regional brand. And uh, they signed a deal in 1997, the year before I got there in 98. And the first thing I did is just used my AIM philosophy uh, of taking all your assets, integrate them in a marketing plan. And so we met with the sales the, um, uh, the marketing, the uh, PR, the promotion, and the advertising firms of Chick-fil-A, along with our people, and said, okay, I call it the MAPS team, marketing, advertising, promotion, PR, and sales, because all of those entities have budgets. All of them have equity in an integrated plan. And if you do something without one of them, you're going to leave them out. You're not going to maximize the integration of your plan. Mm -hmm. So by meeting with the MAPS team, and by the way, I did the same thing when I was with Adidas, when we signed Kobe Bryant, I had probably 100 people in the room from all over the world 
and I said, okay, what are our goals? Because my belief in anything in life starts with a goal. If you don't have a goal that's clearly identified as a SMART goal, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and tangible, you, you don't know the direction you're going to go. Mm-hmm. So AIM is basically taking an asset, in this case, the, the, the Peach Bowl, and making sure that you create through use of, use of the maps, the marketing, advertising, promotion, PR, and salespeople, a map to get you from point A to point B and point B being a return of investment. My belief is if you don't spend three to five times against the asset that you own, in this case, Chick-fil-A buying the bowl game for X, if they don't spend three times that to create a marketing plan, they're not gonna maximize the return of investment against that asset. And so if you commit to that, Now we've got to create the plan of how you're going to spend that three times or five times X in an integrated marketing campaign. And that's what we did. And we were blessed to uh, uh, meet monthly and keep each other against the goals that we created. And we were able to achieve great success. And now we're we're getting ready to sign another five-year contract that will take us through 2025 which will be basically, you know, a, uh, what's that, 19-year deal starting in wow. 97. Well, that's just unheard of now. And, 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 and you just laid out uh, tremendous, tremendous strategies. And so, and it's interesting to note that Steve Robinson had a passion for college football. The core consumer, uh, of Chick-fil-A at the time had a passion for college football. To your point, their store distribution, their mall store distribution laid perfectly over uh, the SEC, ACC um, footprint. So, and now obviously Chick-fil-A is what second largest, third, second or third largest chain in the world, McDonald's, Starbucks, and Chick-fil-A right here in Atlanta. So there's obviously, uh, we're gonna, we're trying to get, and maybe you can help us um, with John Stevens and trying to get Mr. Uh, Dan Cathy on this podcast as well. So, um, you know, the Kathy family has done tremendous things for the community, but speaking of that, Gary, you were one of the pioneers of, of, of turning in uh, a one time bowl game into a 12 month community calendar integrated strategy, which is going to create a lot of career opportunities to create a lot of opportunities within the community. Talk about sort of how that, evolved from a one day bowl game into a 365 day um, a year uh, marketing strategy and community strategy? Well, I'm a big believer when you look at the calendar year, there are certain milestone events that you can create against selling seasons. And again, all this came out of my aim process. You look at certain times of the year and say, okay, this is a selling season. Um, or this is a, a, an opportunity to really put a stake in the ground to market your brand. Um, we had looked at uh, joining the BCS when they created the national championship game in 2006. And we put in a great bid to host the national championship game. And unfortunately for us, the commissioners had decided to Uh, let the existing four bowl games, the Rose, the Sugar, the Orange, and the Fiesta, double host. Wow. Bowl game, their BCS game, and then rotationally, the national championship game. So the BCS national championship game, we lost that bid. But again, out of facing adversity, I said, well, and this is because I'm a competitive son of a gun. I I hate to lose. I said, well... If they're not going to let us in the BCS on the backside of the season, we're going to create the BCS game on the front side of the season. And at the time in 2007, after we lost the bid in 2006, in 2007, the NCAA legislated a 12th game to the college football schedule. So I said, well, we're going to take that game and we're going to go get two top 25 teams 
to start the season and create the Daytona 500 of college football. Wow. And at the same time, in parallel to that, I was working on recruiting the College Football Hall of Fame to Atlanta, mm-hmm. would open the college football season and have the enshrinement ceremonies at the College Football Hall of Fame during the kickoff game. And so um, I was able to go to a friend of mine, again, Terry Don Phillips, who I knew for a long time was the AD at Clemson. And I took him the idea and he loved it and said, yeah, we'd love to come to Atlanta because we recruit there. We've got a lot of players from Georgia and they were going to be number nine in the country with CJ Spiller. Mm -hmm. Um, I went to Alabama because my friend Nick Saban had taken the job there was just coming off a seven and six season where they lost to Louisiana Monroe, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, told him that that was his first season too, right? This was his second, going to be his second season. Yeah. His first season was seven and six. Mm -hmm. And he said, Gary, I'd love to come play. You've been good to me. Um, Because I had extended a bid to LSU when he was the head coach back in 2000, where he really wanted to build the, the, uh, the brand of LSU. And that was the best bowl they could get to. Mm-hmm. Another story I can talk to you about, but mm-hmm. uh, anyway, we uh, we created the uh, Chick Fil A kickoff game. I went to ESPN and said, "Here's my idea," and ESPN went nuts over it because they said, "You know, our ratings to start the season are not very good because you've got most of these big SEC and ACC and Big Ten schools playing, you know, smaller schools uh, and." The games are 55 nothing. Our TV ratings aren't very good. Um, but Alabama was going to be number 25 that year, and, and Clemson was number nine. So we had two ranked teams to start the season. Uh, game day was in Atlanta in Centennial Olympic Park. And so we basically changed the face of college football on the front side of the season, where now Dallas, Houston, Orlando, Charlotte are all – uh, doing oh, yeah. games now, and uh, we continue to do them. Matter of fact, we're going to have three this year in a week with Florida State, West Virginia, Georgia, Virginia, and Auburn and North Carolina. So, um, so basically, we said, okay, the beginning of the season is an opportunity to market yourself. And matter of fact, we took it back to Chick Fil A, and they loved that idea. So now they could have beginning of college football and the end of college football. Um, So that's some of that creative thinking that comes out of that process of AIM, you know, asset integrated marketing, taking assets, integrate them in a marketing campaign during different sales sales seasons and relevant key milestone events to build some kind of uh, brand extension. And that's what we did with the kickoff game. I, that is that is just an amazing story. And so, for our listeners, for our students, you're you, and we're, we're going to use you as a, sort of the microcosm. But you're running a a, a massive uh, bowl organization. You're running a massive kickoff organization. You have this, uh, with the exception of this spring, an amazing event, uh, Lake Oconee uh, for the coaches, and and you bring a lot of coaches together. But <clears throat> talk about within. Peach Bowl, Inc., for example, talk about within your organization where there are opportunities for our recent graduates or rising graduates, and, and then how where are those opportunities on campus that are translatable into working for your, your organization? Because we're trying to say, hey, look, there's so many opportunities that the campus is the ultimate professional lab and there's no reason that you don't go out there and mine those opportunities now, because then you're building those relationships, you're following up, because you've one giant theme today is relationships, 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 building yeah, those, sure. nurturing them. So talk about on the campus and then how that translates to opportunities within Peach Bowl Link. And then I want to know, because I'm sure you get hundreds of resumes a year and your staff does, what gets your attention? What makes a kid stand out? Yeah, you've covered a lot there, which is all great and relevant for your listeners. And if I can, 
Um, I, I compliment each of you for identifying sports marketing as your, your passion and where you want to go. Um, it was different. We never had sports marketing classes. Mm -hmm. Went to school. I studied, studied business management. And so I was kind of on the cusp of, you know, really growing as sports marketing became an industry. Right now, you guys all have a challenge. There are numerous undergraduate programs throughout the United States now because of the growth of sports marketing. There's not only those, but there's numerous graduate degree programs. And in the law of supply and demand, if you graduate as an undergraduate, sometimes there aren't opportunities for you to get a job right out of college. And so you have to go back and get a graduate degree. Um, in the case of Peach Bowl Inc., to answer one of Vince's questions, we hire seven interns a year. They start in mid-June and they go through the end of uh, January. And um, we, we uh, also work very, very hard and we've had a, a pretty good, probably a 90% success rate of placing interns after they have an internship with us in full-time positions. So I think inter internships are a must. Now, what I would challenge you with, because Vince asked another question, how do you get those jobs or those internships? And I've, I've seen thousands of resumes. There's one that I always remember when I talk about resumes. Right. There was a guy by the name of Johnson. And he took a Johnson & Johnson Band-Aid uh, box. And he put his resume inside that little Band-Aid box and on the cover of the, the Band-Aid box, you know, talked about himself. Now, right, right. That, I automatically, because of the creativeness, I said, I want to interview this guy. I don't know if he's going to get a job, if he's, you know, the best candidate, but because of his creativeness, I want to interview him. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean about passion. He was passionate about instead of just putting his resume on a piece of paper, which everybody was going to do, he was going to differentiate himself. So my challenge to you at school is how do you differentiate yourself with your experiences that you get in either undergraduate or graduate school? And then how do you differentiate yourself to me or Vince, a potential uh, uh company that could hire you. And my challenge to you is while you're at school, tell your professors, which I love professors, but a lot of them want to teach the theory of sports management. Right, 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 right. The right. application. You guys should go to your professors and challenge your professor and say, I want an actual job. I want something in my four years of college that I can put on my resume that when I send it to Mr. Stoken and Mr. Thompson, it's going to, it's going to show them that I actually have applicable experience that will translate to a job within their company. And so start a, a three on three, start a road race, start a fundraising campaign, uh, market, uh, your, your women's softball team. Uh, go to the AD and say, look, my, my sports marketing uh, colleagues here will market your gymnastics team or whatever it is. And so you can, number one, what you're getting out of that is you're being creative. Number two, you're differentiating yourself so you have something on your resume. Because I look at your resume next to someone else's, I don't want to see that you just went to school for four years. What do you do to apply yourself? How did you stand out? How did you differentiate yourself? So that's number two. Number three is you're getting applicable experience. So when you create an event at your school, who one of your colleagues is going to be in charge of sales. One's going to be in charge of marketing. One's going to be in charge of PR. One's going to be in charge of event operations. One's going to be in charge of legal. One's going to be in charge of um, finance. Every company, 
I don't care whether it's Coca-Cola or it's the, the Peach Bowl. You need operations, finance, marketing, sales, legal, and um, uh, PR. Mm -hmm. So fill each of those roles. And again, back to my internal philosophy of team, teamwork, empowerment, accountability, management. We hire based on specific roles. Not unlike a coach. I'm an old coach, so I like acronyms. And I and I all I do is coach in my business. Mm -hmm. You want to hire people with a specific role. I want a point guard that can dribble the ball off the floor, knock free throws in at the end of the game, call our offense and defenses out. I want a center who can block shots and rebound, right? I don't want my center bringing the ball up the floor. I don't want my point guard rebounding. Mm -hmm. So everybody has a specific role. So by learning with these events at school, you'll find out, hey, I really like sales. Or you know what? I'm really not good at sales, but I love operations. You know, you'll learn about yourself and you'll learn about your strengths. And then you can put that on your resume and you have something that you've actually done. And if you do that through four years of undergrad, mm -hmm. you do it through four years of graduate school, I can guarantee your resume is going to be full of great things that are going to allow you to be head and shoulders above your other colleagues that are trying to get jobs with just straight resumes that said, I had a 4.0 at Auburn University in sports management. Spot on. And, 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 and Gary, that's why we keep, the, there's two or three things. First of all, the campus is the ultimate professional laboratory. You know, I'm, I'm living proof of that poster child four years of sports information, learned so much from, from David Housel at Auburn. Uh, and in a- One of my all time favorites, by the way, David Housel. Uh, I tell you, be, I wouldn't be here without him. But in a post COVID world, you know, the job market in sports was tough enough for entry level kids because everybody wants to be, or a lot of people want to be in, in our industry. But secondly, you're going to have so many people who are out of work in the marketing services and sports business that more qualified people are going to be willing to take a lesser job for a lesser salary, which is going to further uh, increase the competition for entry level kids. And so, you know, part of what the book I'm you know, writing is brand new, but you've got to, you got to pad that resume. You got to, you got to run cable for Craig Silver. You got to run cable for ESPN college game day. You go work in that ticket office, go work in game day operations, you know, learn the content, learn the social media and all of those things, because, when you're trying to get the attention uh, of a Gary Stoken, um, you know, who's getting a thousand resumes, he's a very busy guy. I love that Johnson uh, example because what he did was he marketed and he packaged himself. He presented his brand to you, but he also was showing you what type of employee he was going to do. He was auditioning for that job. And we tell these kids, you know, Everything, every everything, posting on social media, building your LinkedIn page, connecting with you for LinkedIn, is um, is all about uh, that packaging, that positioning, and building your brand. And so, as we wrap up this fascinating conversation, share with our kids sort of your go-to resources uh, for industry information, other podcasts or books or or models that you follow that you would recommend uh, to our kids to continue to mine uh, for leads and opportunities uh, right now? Well, and I, I think anything that you can read from anybody in the sports marketing world, you should read. And Vince hit upon a great point. You know, I know everybody wants my job as CEO right when they get out of college and you've worked hard at college. You may even worked hard through four years of being a graduate student. But I can guarantee you everybody in sports started at the lowest rung you can imagine. Right. right. And through their passion, through their dedication, through their building relationships, through their hard work, striving for excellence, they were able to succeed at every level. And again, if you're passionate what you do and you're successful what you do, guess what? People are going to want to hire you. So if you're pulling cables for Craig Silver, who's the greatest 
producer of college football out there for CBS. And he sees that you're doing extra work or you're doing a great job. Guess what? When it comes time, you can call him and you're going to get an interview. Mm -hmm. And that's all about, again, building those relationships. If you never pulled those cables, you would have never had a relationship or met Mr. Craig Silver. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of great things. You've got something for your resume. You've learned something. You've built relationships with other people. You've learned whether you like that aspect of the business or not. Get involved, get active. And, you know, that's the best way you can learn anything is you got to get active. Don't just read stuff. You got to apply yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the big differentiator. I would say that a lot of people want to read stuff and say, oh, yeah, I want to be that. Right, right. But you got to put in the work. And there's nothing that suffices for just getting involved, getting activated and and creating something or volunteering, you know, volunteer for something. Mm -hmm. We'll teach you something that will introduce you to people. You'll learn learn about yourself. Um, That's the best thing I can suggest to people. Mm -hmm. That's great. And so, In closing, and I've always, this always made a great uh, impression on me. You end all of your emails with the tag gratitude, attitude with gratitude. Tell, tell, tell our listeners as we wrap up uh, a little bit about that phrase, why you, why you attach that phrase, because it always sticks out in my head when I get, you know, emails from you, we exchange emails and those things. So talk about that as we wrap this up today. Well, I appreciate that in two senses. One is you're kind to remember it, but Now, what have I done? I've differentiated myself with you and I've built a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. A simple end of an email, right? You think differently about me. You think, you know, and and you yourself probably think positively once you get Mm -hmm. email. So I've, I've impacted somebody positively and that's important. There's two phrases I use. One is enjoy the journey. You got to enjoy the journey. God doesn't promise you another second, minute, hour, day in this world. So enjoy the moment. Enjoy the person you're with. Enjoy the work you're doing. Enjoy the studying. Enjoy life because if if you wait until you're retired, if you wait until you get your first job, if you wait until you get that nice car, if you wait until you get your house, A, you may never get those, and B, You've wasted half your life waiting to enjoy life. Right, right. So enjoy the journey, number one. Secondly is have an attitude of gratitude. If I guarantee you, if people are happy around you and they feel good about things, you're going to feel good about them and you're going to want to do business with them. You're going to want to have them as a friend. You're going to want to go out for a meal with them. Um Attitude is such an important and crucial part of success, no matter what you do, Mm -hmm. that people want to be around people that have a positive attitude. And so have an attitude of gratitude toward people. Um, Thank them for being a part partner, for having a relationship or being a vendor, a stakeholder, whatever it is, because at the end of the day, you've made them feel better about their relationship with you. And so you're going to continue that relationship and build it even stronger. Well, uh, just amazing uh, podcast today. Amazing, uh, just amazing insight. Uh, We are so grateful that you shared uh, nearly an hour of your wisdom. Guys, uh, this this is not an understatement when I tell you that that Gary is a, a true pioneer, one of the best big ideas guys that, that, that I've ever known, but then knows how to execute those ideas. And so I want you to listen to this. I want you to re-listen to this. Um, you know, Cause the great thing about careers within bowl organizations and kickoff organizations is there are so many opportunities. Now there are tremendous, uh, uh, you know, year round jobs. They are in bowl games are in so many communities across this country. Um, and they're embedded into, you know, many, many of their communities. So you don't necessarily have to relocate to Atlanta, but, Shreveport and Texas and Arizona and, and North Carolina and where all these and Florida and where all these great you know organizations are, 
but you know, Gary Stoken, CEO and president of Peach Bowl Inc., which oversees these tremendous kickoff classics. We're hoping we have them this year. You know, my Tigers are in them uh, on September the 12th against the Heels and uh, oversees, uh, you know, one of the six CFPs, the Chick-fil-A Bowl, uh, tremendous relationship with the Kathy family. Um, you know, we just thank you so much uh, for your time and contributions. And I'm positive that you will be hearing from many of our students because uh, we're saying, hey, send, send our guys a note, send an appreciation for taking the time and sharing this wisdom uh, as we all battle uh, through the pandemic as we come to the other side of it. But Gary Stoken, CEO, President of Peach Bowl, Inc., we certainly, certainly appreciate, we have a, an attitude of gratitude today toward you for participating. We really, really thank you. Well, I reciprocate that, Vince, an attitude of gratitude for you because you're helping young people and you're helping our industry. And again, it doesn't matter what your uh, feeling of sports is. Uh, I never played college football, and here I am leading a, a bowl game and right. golf game, et cetera. It's all business. It's all sports marketing. So um, I appreciate you listening, and I appreciate, Vince, you having me. And anything we can do to help, we're, we're more than happy. So, students, thank you so much. That wraps another great podcast of virtual summer melt university 2020 and we'll see you soon thanks vince hope you enjoyed today's virtual class we'll be back soon with another edition of melt university 2020